All right, so this is going to be an interesting day. For starters, this is going to be a very interesting um, topic, but leaving that to one side, it's also a mahusive one. Absolutely, absurdly mahusive, says the guy who's willingly taking it on. So, um, yes, it's going to be fun. Not only that, I'm not only doing four introduction videos for today's topic, there's actually going to be a fifth video come out today, which is a bit of a continuation on from the Dream Fleet video. That's going to be fun. Also, I have to admit, I read in a comment recently about some, uh, some on below my YouTube of someone not liking it when I was playing with my nose. I didn't realize I did it, but now ever since I've read that comment, I, I keep, every time I turn the camera, I want to play with my nose. So if you see me playing with cut nose, I do apologize. It's an unconscious habit. Okay, that one wasn't actually unconscious. That was just going. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, right then. So, flying boats and seaplanes, mother by capability or necessity. Now, it's an interesting world to look into these ones. And of course, also you have float planes, which also sometimes are called flying boats or seaplanes. And it gets all sorts of fun. It, it, it's really quite fun and inclusive. So what I'm doing is I've done an introduction to the ones which I think are less well known about in terms of the four introductions, but I'm going to try and cover them all within two and a half hours. I usually give myself roughly on a Thursday. I think at this rate on Thursday, I'm going to be having to start it at half five to have even a chance. Probably going to have to give myself half an hour intro start a starting point, but we'll, we'll carry on. <coughs> We've got this. We have got this. Right then. Bilge pumps! Yay! It's going to be another double episode. It's a double feature this week. Uh, so there's one should have come out yesterday, and one will be coming out tomorrow when these videos go out. And then there'll be another double feature next week. And then we'll go down to one a week, okay? And in my sense way, we do have other things in our lives we love it we love doing bilge pumps but one a week is about what we can manage and that all got through most of the backlog which we built up during the hiatus of changing from being part of the sea control stream to having our own stream and the lovely people at simsec who as i always mentioned are a wonderful charity who do all this okay they are a lovely charity and we're going to get on at some point a guy called chris stockdale on for bilge pumps who's the president of the uk chapter Technically, I'm vice president, and he's te so technically he's my boss. But we'll leave that to one side because we can't let Chris ever think he's my boss. It would give him far too much of an ego. Nah, I love him. He's one of my. He's a good friend, and I'm going to get him on to talk about what Simsec do, what they stand for, and how they're part of the world, and also offer his opinions because he is an excellent specialist, actually, in how navies and maritime water forces get involved in disaster relief. And it's all the sort of stuff which isn't the wartime, which is I sort of like to talk, focus on and talk about occasionally when I'm trying to bring up. He is an absolute, that's what he's doing his PhD in, is how navies are able to help out in scenarios which aren't war, which are disasters, which is when you have uh, an earthquake, a tsunami, whatever, what the navies can do and go in and help with. And it's an amazing PhD. It's proved an absolute nightmare for him to get through, but it's an amazing PhD. So look up Chris Stockdale. He really does know his stuff. Right then. Let's get on to the topic of today, shall we? Now, what were they for? <laughs> no. I'm not changing it. I've got I'm, I managed to get the virtual speed right. It'll be all right. I'm changing it, leaving it. So, what were they for? <laughs> Reconnaissance? Where is that really interesting enemy? Pretty much in the nicest way. You have two great books. And by the way, if you can track down anything by Alex Howlett, that will probably also help you as well. Two great books available on this sort of subject on World War One and what flying boats were up to. You have Anti-Summary Warfare in World War I, British Naval Aviation and Defeat of U-Boats by John J. Abatello. Abatello? I'm not sure. 
which is written by an academic a long time afterwards. And you have the spider's web, which is written by one of the pilots, Theodore Douglas Hallam, otherwise known as Hicks. And that's the spider's web. And the really interesting thing about the spider's web is a, there's some great graphics in it, but you get these little graphics. And I'm going to have to zoom really in close to try and get there. And that shows exactly what they were doing. That shows how they were mapping out their patrols in the channel and off the east coast of England. And he's got more in here. He's got a full detailed one, if I can get to the right page. Yeah, of it. Lots of detail there. Um, that was the wrong way. Sorry, that was wrong. And um, it's just—it's a really, really cool book with lots of infantry. And I'm going to have you talking about some of these uh, these um, flying boats and seaplanes in here today. And they go by various names at the time. They do go by various names. You have lots of fun. They do a lot of work with the destroyers. Um, so there's a lot of work going on between the flying boats and the Harwich Force. So they do a lot of work there. Bombing attacks. Not just with torpedoes. They do actually carry proper bombs and start launching bombs. In fact, many of their first heavy bombers were looked at were going to be flying boats. Because you could take off from water with a lot more work. A lot longer, a lot similar surface than you could build on land. Because remember... This is the infancy of aircraft. There aren't many airfields, especially aren't many airfields with a tarmac runway. I'm trying to think when the first one comes into service. God, that's a difficult question because it depends what you count as a tarmac runway and a proper runway. Well, that's going to be a lot of research. That's, a, that's another topic. I won't jump into that now. Um, Anti-submarine warfare. Because most of the submarines you're dealing with at this time really aren't what we consider submarines. Submarines today go out to sea and they're underwater for weeks, months on end. The ones in this period are underwater for a couple of hours, maybe a few, eight, maybe eight hours, maybe a day. They're slowly growing and growing as the period of time goes on and different types of submarines come in service. But the thing is, when they're underwater, they can't move as fast. They are under far more pressure, all sorts of things. And if, therefore, if you stop them being able to charge their batteries on the surface, if you stop them being able to spend the crews on the surface, you limit the, the submarine's effectiveness quite dramatically. Even before you just go and drop some depth charges on them or something. Not really depth charges, it's more the 100 pound bomb in this period, is, I think, is when it comes out. The anti submarine bomb. Oh my god. Lord. In the First World War, it does sort of have some merit against the construction you're dealing with with some First World War submarines. And air defense. You're going to find it surprising, but actually, they were very good fighters. In a couple of the ones I'm going to be looking at today, in this particular one, are fighters because they were good aircraft for it. Because at this time, fighters, none of no fighters were particularly fast. You've got to remember, streamlining only starts to really come in closer to World War II. So up until then, float plane fighters. Right, so Britain has the flying boat, AD flying boat, and that's sometimes called various different names. So honestly, I'm going with the AD flying boat because you can find that easily on Google. Um, <laughs> there are quite a few other different names that wander around about it. Um, it was designed by the British Admiralty's Air Department. Yes, in World War One, they had an air department which was designing aircraft. I wonder which department they modelled this of. Uh, no, it couldn't be the uh, oh, couldn't be the, the the director of naval construction and the third sea lords department, the controllers department, could it? Wouldn't have made sense for a highly technical navy to a uh, technical service to go with what we already have worked that produces technical stuff. Then copy paste, do more technical, and it worked. Designed in 1915 by Lieutenant, Lin uh, Lieutenant Linton Hope. Um, it was basically a nice biplane. And, you know, there's 27 on the built. 
Uh, manufacturer was Pemberton Billing, apparently. Interesting uh, group. But they actually do serve with quite a lot of people, as well as the UK. Uh, they end up serving with Chile, uh, Japan, Norway, Sweden, and Norway actually even has a civilian operation on one. Uh, I am not really sure how. Um, at a certain point, they get following the end of World War One, they get purchased by Supermarine, that well-known flying boat and seaplane manufacturer. <laughs> You're going to hate me by the end of these introductions because I'm going to run so many opinions of people I have about the generic idea of where the Spitfire comes from. It's designed originally as a float plane, but we won't go into that till we get later. Um, Supermarine purchases the design from the Admiralty following sort of the end of World War One. Interesting that they do have to purchase it from the Admiralty because they own the patents rather than the Air Ministry, which has inherited fully inherited all the aircraft. So, so uh, again, someone in the Admiralty was paying attention because whilst the Air Ministry inherited all the costs of running the aircraft, the Royal Navy kept control of the patents. And um, so, Supermarine purchased them and could produce the Supermarine Channel, or Channel. Channel sounds better, but Channel, I think, is what it is, probably. So, Supermarine Channel. Is it me, or does that sound one of the most depressing names for aircraft known to mankind? Anyway, leaving that to one side, that, of course, is not the only one there. There is also one of my favourites, the Felix Stowe. Now, the Felix Stowe Mark II is one of those cool aircraft which I'm going to be talking about quite a lot shortly because, well, it carries on and on and on. But also, and this is the more fun thing, it has a long relation with the Curtis and the H14 and H16. But, and I'm just finding my notes because I seem to have put them in a different place. I'm trying a new thing where I have notes on the screen. Um, I'm not sure. You can tell me what it thinks, it, yeah, how you think it works, but it's to try and keep things slightly more conventional. So, the Felix Stowe F2 was a 1917 British flying boat, and it's developed by a guy called Lieutenant Commander John Cyril Port, who had served had worked with Curtis before joining the Royal Navy at the beginning of World War One, And again, the Royal Navy basically are going, who do we have in our service who are technically minded that can design anything? You! Design it! And he takes off basically the Curtis ideas and goes, hang on, what's going to suit British Britain more? Um, he takes the hull he just designed for his first Felix Stowe F1, and basically says, right then, Curtis has got wings, very good. Engine will replace with Rolls-Royce, yes. So he's got the aircraft structure, great. Hull, not as good. What do I have hull? I have a good hull over there. And this plane is pretty much a battlefield hot rod before that became a cool name or something. And it really is a battlefield hot rod and a hot rod and a half. And it's a very good aircraft. And it goes on to be developed into the F2, the F3, the F5, all sorts of things. It becomes a long running aircraft for the British, uh, Britain. Uh, first with the Royal Naval Air Service, and then with the Fleet Air Arm. And it has lots of, how do I put this? sort of development and experience and you can really start to see something being built with these aircraft once you look at them you know this is an aircraft which is being built by someone who flies it for them who fly it, uh, for the service they fly from something which already works quite well but the curtis has some issues with landing and taking off from water because landing and taking off from water is not a nice medium it's nicer than a rough, bumpy land strip, which could have all sorts of potholes in and trip your tip wheels up and cause you all sorts of trouble. Uh, it, it's nicer than that. Especially when you consider some of the ones that can be built around the world. But, it's not that nice. It's not something you want to do for fun. 
Hold on, that could be cool. But it is a it's a pretty interesting little aircraft. What I find really cool about them, and I when I was looking this up, this was what really surprised me. Their total weight is less than five tons. It's four thousand nine hundred and eighty kilograms. So the whole thing, we think about the bear moths which go flying today, the whole thing weighs less than five tons. Five metric tons. It's really quite cool. Armed with four 303 Lewis guns. <laughs> and can carry up to 460 pounds of bombs beneath wings. So, you know, it was a fairly effective aircraft. For the time. It's a very nice little aircraft. And this one is a lot more built on them. There is really a lot more built on them. Um, I think it's 175. That's what my notes are saying. So, so 175. But, by the way, the F2 is the one on as far away from me in that corner as you can get. I wanted a decent picture and I didn't want to keep cropping down the picture, so that's why I've done some funny things with the labelling. Hmm. Alright, next one. Next one. Yay, finally. I had to press the end three times. Ah, Germany. It also doesn't always quite like my um, thing going up. The notes going up. Right then, well, for starters, the Hansa Brandenburg W12 is one of those fighters I was talking about. And actually, interesting enough, they have fun with this particular fighter. In that, one of them gets... How do I put this? Well, it crashes, like, it sort of has to do a forced landing off the coast of the Netherlands, who are neutral this time. And um, the Netherlands goes, they look at it over the war. Then post-World War II, they go, um, we'd like to have a license and uh, buy some of these, thank you. Um, because they decide to make it the uh, foundation for quite a large section of their fleet air arm, their naval air service. So the fighters that the Netherlands building were these Hansa Brandenburg W-12s. They basically got shot down. They liked it so much, they wanted them. And they are good aircraft. They really do seem to do quite well for Germany. Um, you do uh, about 180 odd built. And they're used by a lot of various different operators, you know, mainly the Germans and the Netherlands, but a lot of different people in the Germans do like to use them. Technically, it's only the Kaiserlich Marine who have them, but, again, I find stories of other people borrowing them, because they are so nice to fly. So they're quite a cool air little aircraft to look up, and, again, it's teeny aircraft in weight. You know, it's a gross weight of less than one and a half tons. It's teeny. My Impressor weighs more than that. Admittedly, it's a wagon, but it's an impre a super Impressor. It's more than that. Anyway, right then. The Goffer WD-14. So, or Goofer. Um, the idea was these were going to be torpedo planes, torpedo bombers. And the they were going to make up for the difference between the German Navy and the Royal Navy. They were going to allow them to, I don't know, somehow put a break through the blockade or something. Look, they had lots of ideas for how they would use these torpedo bombers and torpedo attack planes. And some were fairly good ideas. Uh, some of them I'm not so sure about, but some of them were fairly good ideas. There don't seem to be a lot of them produced. We're talking about 70-odd. Less than 70, actually, probably, but, you know, roughly 70-odd. And... But interesting enough, the torpedo bombers, considering how the swordfish works out in World War II, uh, has a crew of three. Um, a total weight of... Uh, 
about the fourth, a little over four and a half tons. So actually, I think the WD-40 weighs more than the Felix Toe F2. Let me check my notes again. Because I, no, just. The Felix Toe F2 just about out outweighs the WD-14, just. But it's a very, it's a, it's a cool aircraft and it shows some of the options which the Germans are producing and going for. And also some of the options which are available with these things. The thing is, these aircraft can take off with considerable weight. They can be used in very minimal facilities. And that's a great advantage at the time. Basically, this is your equivalent. The more and more I was looking through float planes and seaplanes, these things, the more and more I was thinking, wow, these are your equivalent of helicopters and Vistal aircraft. Well, probably Harriers more than F-35s. Let's be honest, the Harrier was always more of a bare-bones facility operator than the F-35 is going to be. But, you know, if you want more from an aircraft, it's going to have to require more. And in these things, these aircraft were very much bare bones operations. Quite cool aircraft, though. You notice I'm not really discussing ranges at the moment. And that's because, honestly, the ranges aren't that great. You know, um, sort of Felix, though, its endurance is six hours. That I, I, I do love the way I kept looking for range. Range didn't come up. Endurance came up. Range didn't at any point. Um, for the uh, WD-14, endurance listed as eight hours. Again, range I couldn't find. But now we're on the macro. Um, Mackey, M5, Mackey, M5, I'm sorry, I'm mangling my Italian. And uh, this had an endurance of nearly four hours. Mm, two Vickers machine guns forward. It was an absolutely sweet little fighter. Um, I have to say, it was very much beloved by the Italians. But most of all, it's if you haven't ever seen um, the little cartoon movie, the Porsche Rosa, you are a Porsche Rosa, you are a Japanese sort of anime movie, um, you have missed out on something which is incredibly funny. Admittedly, he doesn't use that particular aircraft during the movie. Um, that was the aircraft he was flying in World War One. He has a far... Uh, Cooler and more red machine in, um, I have to say in the movie, but it's very cool. The Mackie itself is one of those fighters which you you know you probably don't think about, but it's nearly two hundred and fifty of them are built. They serve with Italy. They serve with the United States. Yes. And they served the Brazilians. USN and the US Marine Corps both both picked this aircraft and, bar, and, and buy it, purchase it. Instead of saying, uh, the Italians are selling their aircraft to the Americans. Actually, what's really cool about these things is, again, the British are selling their seaplanes back to the Americans. The Americans are selling their seaplanes to the Brits. This is all going round. And it's one of the interesting things, and I think one of the reasons why in World War One it seems to me that the Allies develop a lot faster than the Germans, is that it's basically, oh, we'll buy yours, we'll have a look at it, oh, then we'll have this idea, and then the other guy goes, oh, we'll buy that back, and we'll buy a copy of your new one back. Ooh, we like these ideas, and Japan, and Italy, and everyone gets into the mix, and everyone's sort of buying their, each other's stuff, and looking and evaluating it, going, ooh, we like that feature, we like that like feature, da 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 da, -da. And it's, it's really quite cool. It's amazing what you can do when your aircraft can be developed and built within the six or seven months. It's great fun. It's a nightmare for a historian to try and work out all the different hundreds of them. So this is why there is a very limited number being looked at in sort of as specific examples but oh my lord does it create fun for the aircraft and these seem to be traditionally whenever i've looked at the stuff because i've been looking at the nascent 
fleet air and almost what it becomes and especially for the carriers i've always concentrated more on the fixed wing aircraft and it's kind of funny because going back for this i've been rediscovering my old notes because I've had to look, I've looked at this in Paris, and every single time I seem to have the same sort of style of discovery. Good lord, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's more stuff than is going on in the many ways of the fixed aviation. The fixed wing stuff is so much concentrated on huge production runs, on getting it out. This one, it's a couple of hundred, and then we're building a new one. It's just a lot, it's, and there's so many aircraft being produced. Right. The American Curtis Model H-12. Now, I have shown you the Felix Stone, the F-2. I'm not going to be showing you the F-5 later, and I'm going to be showing you all sorts of things. Curtis are, in many ways... <sighs> Curtis are the ones who chiefly respond to the Daily Mail's challenge of 1913, of £10,000 plus, I think it was a matching the award put forward by some other groups as well to bump it up really in terms of finances to do a non uh, 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 to do a flight from london to america i think i think it's to cross the atlantic basically and they did talk about london to america but then they went you know nice way but across the atlantic and What's really cool is this is the aircraft which comes up and it starts to come. And it is. It's just a cool aircraft. It's when you realize that there's nearly 500 of these built, that they are first fly in 1914, that they are used by the USN, by the Royal Naval Air Service, and they go everywhere. They are used for so many different things. And then, of course, you also got them used by Brazilians, the Canadians, Netherlands, the Dutch, in other words. It's just, and they're still being used after the RAF is formed. They're still being used. They start out in 1914. Some of them are still in service into the 1920s, and there's even rumours that a couple will make it into the 1930s. They are really, really very reliable aircraft. For such an early on creation, they're really very reliable. Admittedly, their endurance is only six hours. So I'm not sure if they could have crossed the Atlantic, at least the regular version was. I think the version they're planning to cross the Atlantic with was probably going to be one with slightly more fuel tanks in it. Just a few more. Um, they really liked Rolls-Royce Eagle engines, as did the Felix those. And you have a lot of stuff in them, and they're very cool. Now, I have around me what I've been using for quite a lot of information for this. Um, British Naval Aircraft since 1912 by Owen Thetford. And this book cost me four or five pounds, which was lovely, but I think it was very, very undervalued. And There is so much going on. I've also got my USN one back somewhere. If I put that down somewhere and I can't find it. There is so much aircraft being developed. And what's in these things, they're, they're, they're really being evolved in front of you. It's almost live, taking place live now. These aircraft are developing. So, the question we get back to and is quite simple. Are they... Something which is wanted, and I'm just going to quickly scoot back through them to the question. Mother by capability or necessity? Well, actually, it's a rather interesting thing. They have a capability from the beginning, and this in this period, definitely in the First World War. So I'm going to do it for each of the periods. I'm going to try and look to answer the question. In the First World War, they are a massive capability. They far more capability than perhaps necessity. There is a necessity. You do need the reconnaissance aircraft. You do need anti-submarine warfare aircraft. You do need all these things. 
but their capabilities have allowed them to grow into that role because no one really knew you needed these aircraft, really knew this was a viable role for them until you had these aircraft already in service. Sort of, sort of thing, because you had these aircraft already sort of being built and being around and being involved in these long range endurance missions, they're already in people's psyche. So it's a capability which produces a necessity in the First World War, and it's really quite cool. Anyway, right then, to the things I always have to do. So, of course, today it's um, Thursday Night for Jai, it's flying boats and seaplanes, mother by capability or necessity. Uh, the 14th of July, some more admirals, engineers, and historians. Well, that's next Tuesday. Thursday, the 16th of July, naval diplomacy, more than just the tale of empire and gunboats. Should really put the um, brew ships in this a list at some point. And then 20th of July, this next Patreon video, uh, the, the CIA's Royal Navy operations in the Indian Ocean from 1941 to 43. It's gonna be fun. Uh, Thursday, 23rd of July, from the sea. And 28th of July, making Mari Nostrum a hollow jest. And 30th of July, pre tribals, destroyers. <laughs> it's fun times. And where else can you find me? Well, Twitter, at ACNS Conneville, Patron. If you want to vote at the moment, I think it's very nail bitingly close on what's going to be selected for August. The votes are going in, but it's very close. It's literally one or two separating the leaders. And Global Maritime History. I love that site. Anyway, that's World War One. Now to record the interwar. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed this. See you in a bit.